Hello again. Uh, this is lesson 10 of our study in the book of Romans. And uh, we will be in chapter 2, picking up in verse 17 and reading to 29. And obviously, it is a continuation of what it was that we were looking at last week. Um, I'm going to read that passage first, and then we will go ahead and break it down. So beginning in verse 17, this is the ESV. But if you call yourselves a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God and know his will and approve what is excellent because you are instructed from the law, and if you are sure that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth. You then, who teach others, do you not teach yourself? While you preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that one must, must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, dishonor God by breaking the law. For as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. I think that the overall, um, uh, the overall message of that passage is that it's very easy to stand before someone and preach to them and teach them. But what is it that actually matters? It's how you live your life. And that kind of what was what Paul was getting at in the verses that we studied in verse in um, lesson nine. Um, but let's expand a little bit on what uh, Paul is saying here. You know, my second uh, my second favorite book uh, after the Bible is the dictionary. Yes, you know me well, um, and I like uh, definitions of words that are short and concise. Um, that really have to do with what it is that we're referring to. And the, the word that I'm kind of concerned with today is security. Security is really important to us, isn't it? As we, um, as we move further and further toward uh, the elections on uh, November 3rd, um, isn't security one of those things that we are concerned with? We, we want to be secure. There are all kinds of ways that we want to be secure. What's the definition of security? Here it is. The state of being free from danger or threat. The state of being free from danger or threat. That is what security is. How do we look for security in our own lives? Well, we look for job security, don't we? That's important. We have become aware of how important job security is in these past months that we've gone through. We want to be able to pay our bills. <laughs> yeah, we want to be able to pay our bills. We don't want anyone knocking on our door um, looking, for, uh, looking for a bill to be paid that we don't have any way of paying. Um, maybe we think if we get a, um, um, a, 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 a long-term work contract that uh, that will give us job security. Well, I think these days we found that sometimes that doesn't give us job security either because the, uh, someone's able to break the contract. But we look for job security. We look for marital security. We want faithfulness in our marriages, don't we? We want caring relationships. We want mutual um, care, uh, caringness. We want mutual faithful, faithfulness. That would give us uh, marital security. We want uh, national security. We want wise leadership. We want a strong military. Uh, we want our borders uh, secured so that um, the, the enemy is not able to enter uh, through a border and, and threaten us uh, to have, um, uh, we, we want national security. Not only do we as Christians want our leaders to be wise and to make wise decisions, we want them to seek the wisdom of God. Isn't that what we pray? That our leaders would be wise and seek the wisdom of God. That would give us security if we knew that were to be true. We want health security. We want um, health care to be available when we need it. Uh, we want our doctors to be able to have the 
the means that they will need in order to diagnose what is wrong with us, uh, to come to a diagnosis and to be able to uh, prescribe um, uh, a medicine or a treatment that will uh, cure us or uh, alleviate our symptoms. We want um, home security. Uh, we may have um, alarms, uh, fire alarms and, and burglar alarms. We may build um, fences or, or walls to protect uh, what is ours. Uh, we have locks on our doors. We might even have um, big dogs with loud barks and sharp teeth. Um, but whatever it is that we might do to, um, to secure our, our homes, we certainly are willing to do that because security is important to us. Many people, uh, just about anybody, would acknowledge that they are concerned about at least one of these desires for security. But how many people, if you would ask them, what is the thing that you really require security regarding? How many people would say, I'm concerned with my eternal security? I kind of guess not very many. And yet, what is more important? What is more important than our eternal security? Where we will spend our eternity. You know, um, concerning uh, life after death, there are only a, I can only think of four options. Either um, there, um, either um, there's only one heaven, uh, all there is is heaven, and God is going to allow everyone into heaven because He's a loving God. That's universalism. God's just going to let everyone into heaven. I don't know. It's kind of hard to picture a heaven like that that has a whole lot of people in it that don't want to be there. Um, that's heaven? Oh, well, that's one theory anyway, uh, because people have their own idea of what heaven is, and it's not what the scripture describes at all. Or maybe uh, they believe that there's no life after death at all. So why are we even having this discussion? It just e doesn't even, uh, it's, it's, um, eternal security is not even an issue because there is no life after death. There are a number of people who believe, or at least say that they believe that. There have been many a person who has confessed their sins on their deathbed and asked God for that eternal security, uh, even though they spent their lives denying that there was such a thing as heaven. Um, and then there are those who believe that we're recycled. <laughs> uh, recycling human humans. Uh, that we have an opportunity to come back in another life and uh, work toward earning whatever our idea of heaven is. And those who believe in reincarnation are not even consistent with each other on what that is that uh, defines what heaven is. And of course, the last thing is that God will indeed judge our sin and that we will be accountable for that choice that we have made in our life. There is nothing in scripture that indicates that in any way indicates that after death, we will have another opportunity to choose God. No, that opportunity is right here and now here on earth alone. Um, those three options, the first three options that I, that I mentioned, they have no, um, no uh, biblical basis at all. They are an attempt to um, escape judgment by the one who j judges us. Just as uh, the options that we are presented with that are the alternative to acknowledging that God is our creator, uh, they come up with an alternative explanation that they might consider to be easier to live with. Fact of the matter is God is our creator. He is our savior. And he is our judge, like it or not. He is all of those things um, to everyone. No one wants to be punished for their sins, whether we are a two-year-old being put in time out or whether we are an adult who has lived their lives in total um, rebellion against God. No one wants to be judged and punished for our sins. And so um, it is easy to come up with an alternative explanation. And who is it that encourages us to come up with those alternative explanations? It would be Satan. And he is a, he's really good 
at uh, recognizing uh, what it is that uh, we would be uh, prone to believing. Uh, there are other lies that, that Satan would love us to believe that work, um, work in his favor. The first one is that man is basically good. Mm. I don't know. I read my newspaper every single morning, and I don't see a whole lot of stories that illustrate how good man is. There may be one here or there, but they are definitely the uh, exception. But if we believe that man is basically good, then we can believe that God would never send anyone to anything other than heaven, because we are basically good with good intentions. No, but that's a lie that Satan would like us to believe and spread, <laughs> spread to anybody who would be willing to listen. The second word, the, the second uh, idea uh, that we're encouraged to believe that is that if good works and good intentions outweigh the bad works and the bad intentions, then that's good enough for God. There's that old report guard where we're judged excellent, satisfactory, or unsatisfactory. If we have more of the first two than we have of the third, then it is thought that that's good enough for God, as if he would take an average like we do on report cards at school. Uh, take an average, and as long as it's a B plus or an A minus, or maybe even a C or a D, as long as it's passing, then that's good enough for God. I don't see anything in scripture that indicates anything like that. The third is that God is such a loving God that he would save even the most wicked of sinners. Well, that is kind of true, uh, that God does and is willing. Who's, what sinner is more wicked than any other sinner when it comes to God's um, um, view of what sin is, anything that displeases him? Um, he does. He is loving and he is willing to save even the most wicked of sinners. But the determination, the judgment is God's, not ours. We don't get to determine that, um, that border between good, not so good, uh, bad, really bad, and wicked. <laughs> that doesn't happen to be uh, according to us. That is according to God's judgment. And the fourth one, of course, is that there is no God, so why are we even talking about final judgment? And there are many people that would just like to adopt this. I don't even want to think about it, all right? That's pretty much what they say. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, there, there is no God, so there is no judgment, so I don't even have to worry about it. Unfortunately, there are whole religions that are based around and on any one of those ideas that I just mentioned. Um, and unfortunately, they give a false security to those who hold on to them. We talked about security. This is false security. This is depending on something to hold you up that is not capable of holding you up and that it is only a matter of time before it lets go and you fall to the ground. And that time is when we stand before Jesus Christ, the judge, and he tells us what, what it is that we did and judges us for it. Um, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount addressed a lot of those false securities, didn't he? He mentioned many of them and said, those are not the things that, that, um, that you can depend on, but you can depend on these other things that seem uh, not so secure, and yet for God, they are the things that are secure, that we should mourn, that we should um, give from our heart. Um, so Jesus, what did he say to the Jews who considered themselves to be righteous and worthy of heaven? If we go to Matthew 7 and read verses 22 and 23. These are, um, ha these are hard words that Jesus speaks. He says, on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers 
of lawlessness. Very easy to say um, that we are living our lives according to how God would want us to live our lives in obedience to him. But unless we are actually asking God how he wants us to live our lives, what our purpose is and how we can please him, then who else gets to determine how we live our lives but ourselves? And we can say we're doing it for God and we're doing it according to his purpose. But unless we actually are, then we get the reward ourselves. We get to feel good about ourselves because we are just pleasing God and he just needs to be so delighted with us of what we're doing for him. Problem is, if it's not what he asks us to do or commands us to do, then of what value is it? Um, early on in my Christian walk, I was guilty of that sin. I just did everything. Um, I was, you name a ministry, and I was involved in it. I even headed some of them up, and I was just sure that God was going to be just as pleased as could be with me for everything that I was doing for him. Well, um, <laughs> he brought me up short. Uh, yes, he brought me up short, and he took each and every one of those things that I was doing for him away from me until I could come to terms and learn that that's not the way it works. It is obedience to his will that matters. That is what I will be judged on, not, in, not for all the many things that I determined should please him. You know, um, Jesus, uh, Paul is talking to the Jews in this passage because the Jews considered themselves to be chosen. And, the, and indeed, they were chosen, but not because of any, uh, anything that was special about them. Um, they were chosen, again, for two purposes. First of all, they were chosen to be the channel through which uh, all families of the earth would be blessed. That was the promise that Jesus made to Abraham. Through Abraham, all the families of the earth would be blessed because it is through the line of Abraham, through his son Isaac, through Jacob, through Judah, and through King David and down the line that the Savior would uh, come into the, er the, the world. Um, that is why they were chosen, to be that channel through which the Savior would, would come. And secondly, to, um, to um, fulfill their missionary obligation to tell the world about it. And so that's the, where the word chosen uh, refers back to, to be the channel through which the Savior would be born and to inform the world that that Savior had come not because of anything that was special in and of themselves. You know, uh, early on, the, uh, the Jewish people were known, at, were referred to as Hebrews. Hebrew coming from uh, the name Eber, who was an ancestor of, of uh, Abraham. Uh, then they became to be known as Israelites, um, which was based on the name Israel, which was the name that God gave to Jacob, that he changed his name from Jacob to Israel. And so the followers, the descendants of Jacob, were known as Israelites. It wasn't until uh, maybe a couple of centuries before, the, um, before Jesus that the Jews became known as Jews. And the word Jews comes from the word Judah, Judah being the name of the southern kingdom, uh, Judah also being the name of the son of Jacob, uh, from which Jesus would be the descendant of. Uh, and the Jews were proud of, the, of being called Jews at that particular time. Um, it indicated that they were separate from uh, every other culture and civilization. Um, and they thought that it um, uh, more importantly indicated that they were uh, specially favored by God. Well, I've already explained why they were favored by God. And God had indeed isolated the Jews from among the other civilizations and cultures. They were easily identifiable 
they dress differently. They uh, their their uh, eating uh, habits were different. Um, the um, and they worship the one true God. Primarily, that was the the difference between the Jews and the other people, uh, that they um, worshipped only one God and refused to worship any other gods other than that one true God. That was how God isolated them. But then they further isolated themselves. They began to believe that they were indeed special, that God had favored them for salvation, um, that they were the, would be the only ones that would be saved. That is why they uh, tried to win um, Gentiles to Judaism, uh, that, they would, um, uh, that they would make um, Gentiles, um, bring them into Judaism and make them Jews so that they could be special like they were, so that they could be saved like they were, uh, believing that they were the only ones that would attain heaven. And the reason was because they were Jews. Scripture doesn't say that. Nowhere does the scripture say that. Um, they had no desire to share their blessings with anyone. And they viewed those blessings as being a reward um, exclusive to them. And so they had a feeling of pride and superiority. And the, the leaders of the Jews, they were even more prideful and felt even more superior to the regular, to the regular, the regular Jews. They considered that there would be a very special place in heaven for them because God considered them to be even more special. Uh, that's arrogant, isn't it? And, and Jesus calls them out for their arrogance, that exaggerated sense of one's importance or abilities. What does Jesus call them? A brood of vipers. <laughs> A brood of vipers. Mm, sounds sound too special to me. What were they missing? They considered that because they were Abraham's physical descendants, that they um, they were special. But just because they were Abraham's physical descendants did not mean that they were Abraham's spiritual descendants. Um, just because we are a member of a particular church, uh, denomination, just because we attend church, uh, just because we um, participate in Bible studies, uh, there, that, that doesn't that doesn't give us a spiritual, a superior spiritual standing. Um, so even though Paul is talking to the Jews, certainly there is much application for us here. Um, let's read the passage um, uh, from Romans again. Um, actually, I'm going to pick up in verse uh, 21. You then who teach others, that's who he's talking to, those who preach and teach others. So you who teach others, don't you teach yourself? Are you not listening to what it is that you're teaching and you're preaching? Let's think about it. If we are being taught or preached at, <laughs> um, to, by a person who we know does not live according to what he's preaching or teaching, and yet claims to, that would be the clincher. If we are being taught by a person who claims to be above what it is that they are teaching or preaching you, who is basically pointing their finger at you without recognizing that the other fingers are pointing back at themselves and claim a superiority, and we know it, then what kind of value do we put into what it is that they are teaching and preaching? And that is exactly what Paul is pointing out here. Um, you who boast in the law, verse 23, uh, dishonor God by breaking the law. Um, what's the law? The law that Paul is talking about here is the Old Testament. It's the, the books of Moses, the writings of Moses, it's the Psalms and the Proverbs, and it is the writings of the, 
of the prophets, the minor prophets and the, the major prophets. That's the law. They had so much laid out before them. He says, you know the law well. You're able to, to quote it. You, uh, you refer to it frequently. Uh, you praise God by giving him thanks for establishing uh, statutes and uh, precepts and ordinances, but you don't obey it. And what's more important, uh, what's God going to hold you responsible for? Not only is he going to hold you responsible for what it is that you have done, but he's going to hold us responsible for what it is that we taught. And he's not only talking to teachers here. He's not only talking to preachers here because we all are teachers. There is always someone that we are teaching. Well, there is always someone that is learning from us. Um, whether we are uh, deliberately teaching or not, there is always someone that is observing us and learning from us. So therefore, we are all teachers. Um, when you boast about God, when you boast that, uh, that you've been uh, chosen or that you have unique privileges and blessings, um, you, you're really just patting yourself on the back. Um, bad enough that we should think it ourselves, but to teach it to others, uh, Paul has little patience with that. And he says that God considers that to be doubly offensive. Not only that we would live our lives that way, but that we would encourage others to follow that. Uh, Jesus' words when he speaks to the scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, he says, you travel across the sea and land to make a single proselyte. And when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell as others. Do we in our society hold others who have taken an oath of, um, to uphold and enforce the law, do we hold them to a higher standard? Should we hold them to a higher standard? I believe that we should. Um, that a, a judge that has taken an oath, um, um, someone who was sworn into Congress uh, to uphold the law, who chooses to, to bend the law for their own purpose, um, they should be judged harshly because not only has what they've done affected other people, but it encourages other people to go ahead and do the same. It just gets rid of God's, um, God's precepts and God's ordinances and God's commandments and substitutes those of man. Uh, I know that was kind of a loaded question, and I wish we had been together to, to actually discuss that. I would love to hear your feedback on it, but be that as it may, we need to continue. Um, James, before we leave that, that topic, James chapter 3, verse 1, um, he says that those who have great influence on, other, on others do incur a stricter judgment. This is what he says, not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with a stricter, with a greater strictness. Um, those are <clears throat> tough words. Maybe I should just sign off right now. Um, but it makes sense, doesn't it? Uh, when we have an influence on others, then shouldn't we be judged according to a, a stricter judgment? This is what the last verses of our passage for today say, verse 25. For circumcision, indeed, is of value if you obey the law. But if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. So if a man who is uncircumcised keeps the precepts of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? Then he who is physically uncircumcised but keeps the law will condemn you who have the written law code and circumcision but break the law. For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. But a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. 
I am not going to take that verse by verse, <laughs> maybe for obvious reasons. But the purpose of circumcision as commanded by God to Abraham was to be an act of obedience to God for no other reason than because God said so. It was an act of obedience. It was also a reminder uh, to the Jews of the covenant relationship that he had made with them. Uh, a reminder. And as a graphic symbol of the necessity for sin to be removed. Um, acknowledging that we are sinners, but thinking that God is going to let us into his heaven, sin and all, is totally against anything that the scripture preaches. No, the scripture preaches that that sin must be paid for. The wages of sin is death. And so we cannot go into heaven wearing our sin. It needs to be removed from us. And so that was one of the purposes of circumcision, that the Jew, Jewish man would be reminded that sin needs to be removed. The rite of circumcision has no spiritual power. Um, and its, its value is only if the man allows himself to be reminded of what the symbolism is in and of itself. It doesn't save. No more than baptism saves. There are those who say, um, yes, I'm going to heaven because I was baptized. No, <laughs> no. Baptism, again, as circumcision was to the Jews, is a reminder. So is uh, the Lord's table. It is a reminder. It has no spiritual power in and of itself. Baptism has no spiritual power in and of itself. It is a reminder, a recognition of our sinfulness and God's um, paying for the, the penalty for our sins so that we can enter into heaven. Certainly the, the Lord's table is a recognition and a, a, a praise of God for um, being willing to do what had to be done in order that we would spend eternity with him, in order that we would have eternal security, going all the way back to the beginning, to the definition of security. Baptism, circumcision, uh, the Lord's Supper, they do not give us uh, eternal security. It is only the sacrifice of Jesus Christ that does that. Um, we please God by submitting to his will. Again, all the things that we might determine that just going to please God, that's not what pleases God. What pleases him is when we submit, submit to his will. Not by putting that bumper sticker on your car. I never would put a bumper sticker on my car for any number of reasons, but I certainly don't think that that's going to be what's going to please God. Um, Paul says the righteous living Gentile who lives according to the law when he doesn't even know the law should be an embarrassment to the Jew because the Jew knows the law and yet chooses not to live according to it. Um, how many people do you know that we would consider not to be believers who do not claim to be believer? And yet they are wonderful people, uh, generous to a fault, kind and uh, solicitous, uh, pleasant and affectionate. Um, aren't they somewhat of an embarrassment uh, when we compare them to some believers that we know or maybe even to ourselves and say, well, I'm not sure anybody would call me wonderful. I'm not sure that anybody would call to identify me as being generous to a fault, kind and um, sympathetic and, and compassionate. Um, excuse me while I go and meditate on that. Um, I'm going to see you next lesson. Love you. I do love you. I really do. I love you.